Hello all. Welcome to the new Simply Put series by Kalam IS Academy. This is Priyanka Mahapatra, faculty at Kalam IS. So today we'll be having a discussion on the newspaper dated 19th December 2023. So the text and the context section of the Hindu newspaper had an important article today about the COP28 and what does it mean for the cities. This is very important from our exam point of view. So we would be discussing that. Other than that, another article appeared about the Shahi Idga, which we have already discussed yesterday in the history of Krishna Janmasthan, right? Then again, coming to the explain section of the Indian Express newspaper, two important articles appear today about the Arctic research. This we are going to discuss again how MPs are suspended, right? So these are the three articles today we are going to discuss, which are displayed on your screen. So the first article is about the COP28 and what does it matter for the cities? What does it mean for the cities? So this is in context of the COP28 where the leaders of late they have realized that the desired results of the Paris commitments are not possible without addressing the urban issues. In fact, a special day was dedicated to a ministerial meeting there on urbanization and climate change. So this brings to the question that how are cities important with respect to the climate change? Why cities are so important with respect to the tackling of climate change? Because currently 55% of the global population is urban now. And they are expected to reach 68% by 2050. So this is very, very important fact. You must be remembering by heart. Whenever there is a question asked about urbanization, about the global warming impact on cities, you need to write the why aspect first. And this fact will come handy while writing such answers, right? Then it consumes nearly 75% of the primary energy. It's responsible for nearly 70% of the CO2 emissions, 76% of the greenhouse gas emissions. In fact, the city is defined excluded from the process of climate change talks. They're not part of the preparation of the NDC or the National Adaptation Plan. In fact, there is hardly any representation of city leaders and civil society groups whenever this talks are happening in this process of tackling the climate change. So this needs to be changed. Because cities, they are the key actors in driving the climate ambition forward and creating green jobs, reducing air pollution and improving the human health and the well-being. Right? And this situation of cities is all the more worse in the cities of the global south. And the cities of the global south they require more support. Why is that? Because they are far more vulnerable than the western counterparts. The city leaders again are hardly empowered to take any initiatives from their side regarding any innovation out of the box thinking. And the major employment there lies in the informal sector. Again, in countries like India, 40% of the urban population they live in slums. So there is lack of basic services there, basic hygiene there. People are facing the social and the economic inequities there. That is why the global south is considered for the climate actions now. Right? So for the reasons discussed, we need to recognize the role of subnational governments. We need to recognize the role of local governments in global climate change negotiations. Right? We need to accelerate and scale up the climate action by working across all the governance all levels of governance and sectors through providing them direct financing or technical assistance for that matter. But here the main challenge remains that whenever we are going to such deep, whenever we are talking about bringing out of the box thinking through innovation and creativity, that means it would transgress the authorities of the federal governments there. Right? So any unconventional thinking, it may involve transgressing the authorities of the federal governments. But despite all the challenges, we need to take care of the role of cities because they play a crucial role in advocating or advancing the climate ambition. 
so as per many experts there has been many solutions around they say that we need to create a, a climate atlas for all these cities mapping them and identifying the hot spots would help us okay we need to give a major support system to the existing financial architecture we need to give technological know how in fact we can take the example of chennai over here where it is acting as a model city where it is spearheading their climate action plan and they are already deciding themselves to meet the zero emission targets by 2050 that is much ahead of the national goal by 2070 right so here cities are at the forefront in reclaiming spaces in meeting climate action plans hence they should be getting a fair share in the all planning that is happening with respect to mitigation or adaptation strategies right so this was all about this topics discussion so the second article is about the 78 opposition mps they got suspended that is most ever in a day 33 lok sabha members and 45 from rajya sabha all belonging to the opposition india group they got suspended so why this happened are suspensions very common what does parliamentary rule say about it how long can mps be suspended for and why do mps disrupt the parliament for that matter so these things we are going to discuss here so now coming to the numbers that almost 12% of the combined strength of parliament they are now suspended so the reason for the suspension being that the mps in both the houses were disrupting the parliamentary proceedings with protesting the last week's parliamentary security breach that happened right then the first question is that why do mps disrupt the parliament right so there are four or five reasons to it four or five broad reasons to it due to which mps disrupt the parliament first is lack of time lack of time available to mps so whenever there is a time crunch it can hinder the meaningful discussions even hinder the effective representation effective bringing up the issues of the constituency concerned with that mp so here the mp will be compelled to resort to such disruptive tactics in order to draw attention to the main issues right then secondly it is due to the unresponsive attitude of the government also if the government does not adequately address the concerns or demands raised by the opposition mps then that can lead to frustration of the mps and then they resort to such disruptive tactics again it is also done for the political and publicity purpose so these disruptive tactics like shouting slogans walking out creating disturbances these measures are used very strategically by very uh, various political parties in order to draw attention to the specific issues even garnering support public support or even creating a perception of the government's inefficiency then the fourth reason is that absence of prompt action against mps disrupting the parliamentary proceedings very very important so if the disruptive behavior is not met with immediate consequences then there is a encouragement it's a culture of um encouragement that comes to spread disorder like this it may encourage a culture of disorder always a disruptiveness always so lack of accountability in that situation can embolden the mps to continue with the disruptive actions without any fear of repercussions so we need to have immediate action plan we need to take immediate steps against any kind of disruption created intentionally then the fifth reason is that parliament has not updated its rules for the last 70 years in this regard so if the rules have not been revised then it may result to the legislative framework that does not effectively address the contemporary challenge or the changing dynamics of the parliament of the society right so these are the broad four five reasons you should be knowing about that why mps disrupt the parliament then we come to the question that who can suspend the mps and how so lok sabha they follow rules rajya sabha also follow some rules 
they follow rules like 373 374 and 374a and rajya sabha follows similar rules like 255 and 256 so the process of suspension is similar the presiding officer for that matter speaker of the lok sabha and the chairman of the rajya sabha they can first direct an mp to withdraw for disorderly conduct okay so the presiding officer being the leader of the house he or she has got the power to first first direct an mp to withdraw for the disorderly conduct so if the disruption continues then the legislator can be named also okay and then a motion can be moved to suspend the mp until the sessions end so this is the process of suspension so in 2001 a change happened in this regard in the case of lok sabha not rajya sabha very very important to remember that in lok sabha rule 374a was added it was introduced where naming of mp was enough for the automatic suspension if we name a mp by the presiding officer okay so that would lead to the automatic suspension for 5 days or the remaining session thus there was no need for a separate motion thereafter right so this is important again in rajya sabha the naming provision was not adopted therefore a motion was required for the suspension as seen in the case of parliamentary affairs minister prahlad joshi now the next question is that how long can the mp's be suspended for what is the time period so basically these disciplinary measures they form a hierarchy they are forming a hierarchy with mild offenses leading to reprimand okay then it is escalating to withdrawal or suspension then in cases of extreme misconduct expulsion can also happen from the parliament so mild offenses they result in admonition or reprimand rule 373 allows the speaker to di direct the withdrawal of a member if their conduct is grossly disorderly then ignoring the presiding officer's direction that can lead to punishment of suspension right and then uh, in cases of severe misconduct the house may opt for expulsion and what is the duration they are suspended for the maximum of the remainder of the session and the suspension is temporary it applies only for the ongoing session of the parliament these facts are very very important from your prelims point of view and even the house has the authority to reinstate a suspended member at any point of time this is also very very important through a passage of motion by the house again so these facts can come as options in your prelims exam so you need to be very clear what are the provisions there has to be just a familiarity of these things these measures uh, would be enough for you to answer those questions right so now the question is that is suspending mp is a common practice so actually it has gone up during the last few years so it was only 36 during the period of 2009 to 2014 then 81 then it is now 149 suspensions that has happened since 2019 so it is rising it is going up over the last few years so here uh, the solutions for lessening down the disruption in the parliament is to ensure the effective communication between the government and the opposition parties right and also to bring a deterrence among the mps we need to institute certain measures to hold the disruptive mps accountable for their action immediately right this is also very very important and whatever changes we are making that has to be long term any changes in the rules we are making that has to be consistent with the democratic values and with a changing india right so this is all about this topics so the third article is about the himadri which is the india's arctic research station you need to know from the prelims point of view and it is Uh, stationed in the norwegian archipelago of salvard and the news is that it will remain operational throughout the year now before it was the research in the arctic research station himadri was limited in the limited to the summer months because of the extreme temperatures there but now the research will also happen in the winter season now it is already operational it will go on till january 15 2024 right 
and the research areas in the arctic region has been the atmospheric sciences astronomy astrophysics climate studies it, they will also study the lightning over the arctic in the winter season the role of precipitation in the climate change the characterization of radio frequency environment and the role of aerosols on climate change so these facts you need to know from your prelims point of view so this is the figure of this is the picture of himadri in the arctic region and the basis in arctic comprises of at least 10 countries there you can see the basis how they are stationed in the arctic region okay so they have at least 10 countries they have set up their permanent facilities at the arctic research base and the research was limited to the summer months but now india will be joining a small group of countries that will operate their arctic research bases throughout the winter then the area above the arctic circle as you can see in the map this is the arctic circle and the area above the arctic circle this is the main research area okay so it has got the parts of it, the eight countries that make the arctic council very very important from the prelims point of view it has been already asked in the upsc prelims so it becomes important for you to remember question can come again also so the eight countries are russia us you can see in the map denmark iceland norway sweden finland right and the arctic ocean so this this is the area where the research is happening again uh, the scientific research in the arctic region it is governed by the treaties like salva treaty of 1920 un convention on the law of seas and also the individual jurisdiction of the arctic countries so coming to the impact of warming this is one of the pristine environment where the scientists can study the impact of warming here the scientists are seeing the melting ponds you can see in the picture it's a melting pond in the arctic region so the impact of warming there has been quite significant okay it is directly visible there there has been 4 degree celsius rise on average over the last 100 years 2023 was the warmest year on record according to ipcc the sea ice has been declining there at the rate of 13% per decade very very important to remember so if this rate continues then the arctic is going to become ice free in less than 20 years so see the extent of global warming happening and extent of impact that we are seeing on earth so any significant change in the arctic region can directly influence the atmospheric circulation all over the globe so the increase in tropical sea surface temperature because of the melting of the ice that can lead lead to increased precipitation in the tropics a shift in the itcz and a high chance of an increase in the extreme rainfall events that we are witnessing already in the form of extreme cyclonic events right again any milder weather due to the global warming can make arctic a more habitable and less hostile place of course there the countries will come and control the trade navigation and other strategic sectors like oil minerals in the region right so this has been the impact of warming you can write it down in your notes then india signed the salva treaty in paris in 1920 that is a foundational treaty for any international cooperation and research activities in the arctic region so it has signed since 1920 but there was a delay in the expedition so the first expedition happened only in 2007 right then we should be knowing the permanent research stations in the poles okay so india's permanent research station is himadri in the arctic which commenced its operation in the year 2008 dakshin gangotri it was actually established before it it is one of the earlier research station it was established in 1983 before himadri so it marked the beginning of india's engagement in polar research this can come as question also that which station marked the beginning of india's engagement in polar research it is dakshin gangotri not himadri right so dakshin gangotri it is now submerged 
under ice so india has two other active antarctic research stations that is maitri and bharti so here a trick to remember that the longest name the bigger name it is submerged in ice it is now not operational not active and the other three are active himadri being in the north the north pole and maitri and bharati in the south pole right so this picture is just for your information at the last you should be knowing this can also come as option in your prelims exam okay gruva vadet atmospheric laboratory it is the india's northern most laboratory with respect to the atmospheric research it is at the feet of jeppelin mountain in norway okay so there the studies are happening with particular focus on aerosols study of the atmospheric composition with a particular focus on aerosols that are happening okay so this is for your information so this was today's discussion so i want to emphasize that the short notes of this discussion is available in our telegram channel so the link for joining the telegram channel will be provided in our description box so do join us until then goodbye take care and please do comment that how are you feeling about the video okay anything else you want me to discuss that you can write it in the comment section and i would be replying to you all okay so until then take care goodbye and happy learning